and I'm going to talk uh, first of all about my favourite subject, which is uh, me. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, film school in London. Uh, and then I'm going to talk, uh, if we have time, a little bit about the Western idea of story, uh, more the British idea of story. And um, so that was, uh, that's what I'm going to do. As you know, in Britain has just Brexit. That was me a bit, a few years ago. I had, uh, I was very, <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's me, yeah. You see, smoking a cigarette. I was arrested in, in Kyoto Main Square for smoking cigarette. They told me you're not allowed to. Uh, this is just a description of, of Europe, like England, terrible food, ugly girls, invented soccer, hooligans. You know, the, 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 it's the way we look at the world. French, good wines, beautiful things, pretend not to speak English. You know, Germans, good machines, ugly girls, beer, wear socks and sandals. So that's just to give you a light uh, beginning because obviously the world is changing in the UK. Uh, I've just come back from Buenos Aires. Uh, that's me with my new friend Maradona. And uh, then on Monday, I was in Beijing. This is Beijing Wall. As you can see, it's not kind of flat. It goes kind of like this. I wanted to go to the toilet, but I, I thought it was too far. <laughs> and then uh, I'm now uh, in Kyoto. And so, uh, uh, and so Ken's friend, Mac, he sent me some pictures of Albert Einstein and Charlie Chaplin in Japan, but I don't know if they were in Kyoto. They, they might have been somewhere else. And that's just sort of where I've been. So this, uh, and I'm going to talk about myself and some of the lessons which I have learnt, which may or may not apply to you. And I like to use, uh, I like to use proverbs. This is proverb from the country of Uzbekistan. You know, in uh, Russia, you know, you don't choose a house, you choose neighbors. That when you want to be successful at things, it's the people, not the, not the organization or the institution that is the important thing. This is my first partner. He's a guy called Richard Branson. He owns Virgin and uh, Virgin Atlantic. He likes to dress in women's clothes. So this was, he made a bet with... Uh, billionaire from, from Southeast Asia, I think from Thailand or somewhere, which he lost. And he said if he lost it, he would dress as a virgin stewardess. Uh, but he always had that. But what the second lesson which I have always learnt, and it's particularly important for filmmaking, is, you know, one head is a head, two heads are gold, three heads are platinum. That this ability of people to work together is an incredibly important thing to doing really interesting work. It's so, it's much harder to do it on your own. And uh, so myself and Richard Branson, we started a record company making records by rock musicians. And uh, we were, this is me at the age of 19, same age as some of you guys. Uh, I had already been in business at this point for two years. So I had started at 17 years old. I had left school at 16 years old. I only went to university for one semester, and that was because I couldn't agree my deal with Richard Branson. I couldn't agree how many, how many shares he had and how many shares I had. But uh, we were then selling records, other people's records, uh, and um, we were like a hippie company. So these were our first employees. It's interesting, but I can remember the names of all of the women in the picture, but only a few of the men. That's me. That's uh, Richard Branson. That's Wendy. That's Cynthia. That's another Wendy, etc. So we, used, we employed hippies because they were cheap. And they came 
into work very late, like 11 o'clock, but they worked late and then they would go to clubs and they would see bands and they would come back and tell me and Richard if they saw bands that were really interesting. And then uh, we started some shops, some kind of hippie shops. Um, and you understand the word hippie? Yeah, hippie, 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 hippie. Okay, good. And then we signed, uh, uh, it's a bit off the screen actually, but there you go. We signed uh, another hippie, and he made a, a, a rock album, which had no lyrics, were no words on it, and that was picked up and put on William Friedkin's Hollywood film, The Exorcist, which was uh, like a horror film. That was my first time I came in connection with the film business, because really I am a rock and roll boy who stumbled on film. Uh, and. Um, and that sold a lot of uh, copies and sold our financial problems. But it was quite interesting when we were trying to do, uh, we call it a license, but when we were trying to sell the rights of tubular bells in Japan, uh, my partner Richard, he flew here to Japan. We went to each of the Japanese companies. And the first one Richard went to and they said, so how much money do you want uh, do you want us to pay for Japanese rights? So Richard said, like, oh, $100,000. And they all went, hi, 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 hi. And we thought, fantastic. And he called me up, he said, we got a deal for 100. And next, tomorrow, I asked for half a million, 500,000. So he went the next day to, uh, to the second company and he asked for 500,000. And you know, it's like 10 Japanese record executives and they all went, hi, 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 hi. So I thought, fantastic. So then we went, he went the next day to the third company and then we asked a million. And they all did the same thing happened. And then he called me up, which is fantastic. We have one million from Japan. And I said to Richard, no, I have just looked, looked up again the, the dictionary, the Japanese Dictionary. I've talked to my Japanese friend, and hi does, means yes, I understand, not yes, I agree. So we had come all the way here, and we ended up with like $50,000 or something. But we thought we were getting the biggest deal of our life. And uh, so then we went in to put out a lot of records, pop records from the, from the, uh, uh, in the 1970s. So like Culture Club and Phil Collins and the Sex Pistols and, and so on. And, uh, and that was a, a lot of fun. The Sex Pistols were very controversial. And uh, I once took Sid Vicious to, from London to Stockholm, and, uh, which was, uh, uh, he spent the whole, the whole journey in the toilet, funnily enough. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember when we arrived at the airport in Stockholm, there was a pop group called ABBA. I don't know if you've heard of ABBA, the pop group, probably before their time. The old guys have. Have you, Ken, heard of ABBA? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. But these ones haven't. So Sid said, uh, I want to meet ABBA. And he started going towards you, the big guy, big punk, quite. And uh, ABBA ran in the other direction. I don't think they knew it was Sid Vicious. But that's, um, so this is the lesson here for, for me. This is Korean proverb. You know, he cannot tell the difference between crap and bean paste. It's not so easy, actually, but... Um, uh, but this ability to spot in your class, in your studies, in your friends, which ones are going to be successful. And they are not always the ones who are good academically. You know, often they are the ones who are not good academically. They are not always the ones who are, we call it the spirit of the party. You know, are doing a lot of socializing, a lot of entertaining, a lot of drinking and so on. It's finding the people with, with real talent that is going to make an impact on the world because these are the people that you want to be working with and finding ideas to do things together with, especially in film, you know, because if you're a director, you need a cinematographer. If you don't write, you need a writer. If you, uh, you need an editor, you, you need a producer, you need distribution. So the more people that you can connect with who have real talent is important. Do you have KFC here in Japan? 
KFC, yeah? yeah? This is the chart of things that taste like chicken. You know, like crocodile, rat, snake, emu, and then KFC is the least like chicken, the less. But it's knowing, you know, what, what, uh, what really tastes like chicken. And this is the next lesson, because uh, people at universities, they are always try thinking in terms of, I have to have a job. You know, I have to be employed by a corporation or a company or an institution. Then this is, you know, uh, and is in the West, it's definitely the case. And every parent brings up their children to say, get a job, get a job, get a job. I think this is wrong especially in today's world. And uh, what the parents should be saying to their kids is find an activity that you can make a living from, that you can make money from, to pay the rent and raise children and so on. You know, artists like, uh, like Professor Toza, and uh, you know, who are not employed people. Uh, because when you are employed, you are at the mercy of the boss. This says, when the top guys look down, they see only shitheads. When the bottom guys look up, they see only arseholes. Sorry about the phrase. Um, and it's kind of a play on, on, on American words, actually, rather than British words. And, uh, but don't ever let, it's always better to be boss. Even if you are a small boss or only your own boss, because you are, uh, than it is to be employed. And that's really at the NFTS what we are trying to achieve. And of course, when you are a boss, you have responsibility. And uh, the number one thing about leadership is to take responsibility for everything around you. And what is happening, the, the, the best students I have, they never blame anyone else. If something goes wrong, it's their fault. Maybe they chose the wrong person. You know, maybe they didn't give them enough instruction. Maybe they didn't realize that they have particular challenges and so on. So it's a really important thing. Just to let you know, I have, uh, it, d it doesn't come out at the top there, but um, uh, I have uh, produced 46, almost 50 movies now uh, over the last one. This is, they wrote a book about me in England, The Egos Have Landed. This was like a funny title at the time. And, uh, and they are, uh, Ladies in Lavender was the last film I made before going to the National Film and Television School. It's because my mother, she said to me, she got to the age of like 85, and she said, Nick, I can now tell you the truth. I don't like any of your movies. So I said to myself, sure, because I have many brothers and a sister and so on, and uh, so I'm thinking of her will. So I said, uh, so I thought to myself, I have to find a movie that my mother will like. And uh, one, of a British, uh, one of the big British actors said to me one day that he had a project, and the project involved two very old people, you know, one of whom has a crush on a very young man. And I said, fantastic, my mother is going to love this. So I said to him, who will write it? And he said, I will. And he's an actor, not writer. So my heart sank. And then I thought of my mother, and I went, Charles, very good idea. I said, who's going to direct it? And he went, I am going to direct it, Nick. He has never directed anything. My heart sank. Uh, but then I thought of my mother, and I said, brilliant idea, Charles. You will be a great director. So it's funny how projects come out, and he did a lovely job. And uh, my mother, she loved the movie. We had the premiere with the Queen of England. So she was, uh, my mother was particularly pleased. And uh, uh, so it was a very nice um, experience so when you do something, not for commercial reasons, not for artistic reasons, but because you want your mother's love. You know, and I was like 55 at the time. Whoops. And this is uh, my last movie, which is uh, Guy Pearce and Dakota Fanning. Uh, this was uh, finished this year. It premiered at the Venice Film Festival. 
and then he went to Toronto Film Festival, and it just last week, week before last, played uh, played uh, London Film Festival. It's a tough film. It's very violent. I think times have changed, because for me, it's not violent. I mean, it's violent, but it's you know fine. It's not like a problem. But for the modern audience, they, they were quite upset about about the amount of violence, especially violence to women, in the film. And uh, so it was an interesting experience. It's a very good film, even if I say it myself. So just going backwards a little bit, you know, after The Virgin, um, I, uh, first of all, uh, myself and my partner, we had a cinema in uh, London by King's Cross Station. It's, uh, it's now a big clubbing venue, but we had it as a cinema. This was like our audience. We played uh, uh, what's called repertory cinema, so we played older films from across the world, but a lot of American independent movies from people like John Waters and, and others. But we then started distributing movies. So we distributed movies like Evil Dead, uh, Oshima's Merry Christmas. Uh, we also distributed some other Japanese movies in reissue, like uh, Rashomon, uh, Yojimbo, and other classical Japanese uh, uh, movies. We distributed maybe six, seven hundred movies. I'm just picking some of the Japanese classics out. So we thought we are distributing all these movies. Uh, it cannot be that hard to make them. So we started making our own movies. We did the first one called Company of Wolves. And uh, we were very uh, lucky because it, uh, you know, it was a big hit in the UK. In the same way with our, my first record at Virgin, it was a very big hit in the UK. And uh, so it was, we were very lucky. And it's kind of a modern version of, of Little Red Riding Hood, the British fairy tale. Well, it's not British, actually. It's like European fairy tale. Uh, and um, so we were doing those, and then... Uh, we started uh, um, Mona Lisa, which got Oscar nomination for Bob Hoskins and also won the Cannes Film Festival. But we were also trying out a uh, uh, musical, you know, a kind of Hollywood style, modern musical called Absolute Beginners with the late David Bowie as, as, as the big star in it. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because this movie was, did a big, uh, good box office in the UK. Uh, but the critics hated it. They said, like, absolute disaster. And in America, it did no box office, but the critics loved it and thought it was a brilliant film. So it depends where you are in the world as to what people, you know, will think. And I had a royal premiere with, of all this film uh, with, uh, with Princess Anne, uh, the daughter of, uh, of the Queen. And she... Uh, I remember her saying, the film is set in 1959 London, uh, and it's about two young people experiencing the music, the art, and so on, of kind of underground London of 1959 by Colin McInnes. And in, in one of the early scenes, uh, uh, actor and actress, they are walking over this bridge, and, and I'm sitting next to Princess Anne, and she says to me, Nick, Nick, that bridge was not there in 1959 when the movie was set. So I said, of course it was there, we wouldn't make a mistake like that and put uh, something that was after 1959 in the 1950s. She said, Nick, do not argue with me. You know, like royalty to a peasant. And, uh, and I said, uh, no, it definitely was there, it was definitely. She said, Nick, do not argue with me. I know because I opened it. You know, she cut the, the ribbon to open the official bridge. Unfortunately, after 1959. And um, we did a movie called A Crying Game, which was uh, the biggest independent movie in America uh, in the year in which it was released. And it was pretty big. It had six uh, Oscar nominations, and it won, including for Best Film. Uh, and it won only one of them for Best Script. And uh, so we were, um, we were doing well. But then, uh, uh, but then uh, we went bankrupt, and uh, I have a longer thing. But uh, 
Uh, we, we, there was a financial crisis in the UK. We had borrowed too much money. We couldn't pay our bills. So it was, you know, time. And, uh, but we started again. And we started with these, uh, these movies. This had Oscar nomination as well, Little Voice for the, for the actress, uh, for Brenda Blethyn and uh, the British actress. And um, Fever Pitch is, uh, it's my favorite, but not as a film because it's a great film about the Arsenal Football Club. I'm a big football fan. And you know, the, the Arsenal Football Club is like the best in the premiership. Um, but uh, they were like, they were quite interesting. Backbeat was quite a lot based on real life. And uh, Backbeat was about the Beatles before they were famous, the English pop group, the Beatles, before they were famous uh, and was set in Hamburg at the time. And was really a story about the fifth Beatle who died and was never in the, the band when they became famous. And he had a German girlfriend, and, uh, which was, um, uh, was quite, uh, there's a nice, there's a scene, but well, actually it's not in the movie, but it's in the script, you'll be interested in. So the main character, Stuart Sutcliffe, he says in the script to, to his girlfriend, he says, look, the only problem is that my father, this is set in like 1959, 60, my father, tells me that you Germans have no sense of humor, which is, I know, not true, but that's in the script. And she says, so she thinks for a bit, and, and she says, so we don't have a sense of humor. We bombed Liverpool, <laughs> which for an English person is funny, but as long as you're not a Liverpudlian. But the interesting thing was I like this scene a lot because it's counter stereotype, because it, it brings out the, uh, the humor of... Uh, 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 of a um, German, uh, of a German character, and uh, so uh, I wanted to keep it in the movie, but the director did not, and uh, so we decided we have little test screening. In other words, we show the movie while we are cutting it to a group of um, uh, mainly friends, but honest friends, friends who are, will really tell us what is working, what is not working, and give us feedback to help us to get the movie to work. So we played a movie and uh, the director says, uh, Nick, we will keep the movie in, keep the scene in, if everyone laughs. So we play the movie, everyone laughs. I go out to speak to Ian. I said, Ian, we keep it in. Yeah, everybody laughed. And he went, no, Nick, we're not keeping it in. I said, what do you mean? Everybody laughed. He said, no, no, Nick, not everyone laughed. Only you laughed. But when you laugh yourself, you kind of think that everybody else is laughing. Uh, so it's not in the, in the movie, and um, but also this is uh, a uh, is quite interesting here because one one two three of those films were bought to me by ex girlfriends. So this is uh, important. I think when you're at a university, you know this is Uzbek proverb again: do not slam the door you are going to have to come back through. So these were, uh, you know, so of those three movies, um, of those three movies, The Last Orders, Calendar Girls, and, uh, and, um, uh, and Fever Pitch were all bought to me by ex-girlfriends because they, they kept the relationships going because they were very intelligent people. They were good at their jobs, even if we were not in relationship anymore. And I just always say to my students, like, when you are working with people in close situation, like in a university or in a small school like ours, because we are only 350 students, don't fall out with people. In personally, that means you cannot then work with them uh, on your films. So it's just uh, an important thing. This was a... Um, I did a film called uh, Dark Blood uh, with uh, the actor River Phoenix, who was the older brother of Wackin Phoenix. And he, it was an interesting, um, it wasn't interesting, it was very sad because during the middle of filming, 
uh, River died of a drug overdose. Um, and I think by a funny kind of way it was because we were in the desert and uh, there was not really much drugs, etc., around, but when he went back to Los Angeles, he kind of overdid it. So it's very sad. And, uh, but sometimes I think to myself that he would not have died because if I had not got out of an elevator one morning in Cannes, what happened at Cannes Film Festival? At Cannes Film Festival, this is where us producers, people think it's glamorous and everything. For us, we go there to raise money for our films and to promote our films and so on. And one morning I, I walked into the main hotel. There are a lot of people, they're all going to their offices. And I, there was a lift, just the elevator there. And uh, I stepped into the elevator, which was already full. And then uh, a very beautiful Italian actress, she stepped into the elevator. And then a big producer uh, called Harvey Weinstein, uh, you know, uh, he stepped in. And then the doors closed and opened again because there's like too many people in the lift. So I said uh, to everybody, you know, I'm polite Englishman. Don't worry, everybody, even though I wanted them to know my meeting is on sixth floor, I will get out of the lift and walk up the stairs. I was kind of trying to impress the Italian actress. I thought maybe she would like to think this was cool. And uh, so the doors closed, they went up. As I walk up the stairs, I meet another big uh, fin financier producer called Bob Shea. He produced uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, and he said to me, Nick, uh, this uh, script for Backbeat, you know, we love it. We love uh, River Phoenix. We are not sure about the director, but let's do a deal. So I did a deal for $7 million and we made the film. And I think sometimes if I had not got out of the lift that morning, I would not have met Bob Shea. I wouldn't have got the film funded and River Phoenix would not have died. But I'm not taking responsibility for that, but I'm just saying chain of kind of events. And ladies and lambda, we already talked about. So here's another lesson that uh, filmmakers especially, but I think it also applies to other forms of art and indeed for other forms of uh, learning. You know, what I find with our filmmakers is the first step is they try to imitate their heroes. If they love Scorsese, you can bet your bottom's dollar that their first film will try to be like a Scorsese film. You know, uh, if, they, if they love Kurosawa or Ozu, their first film will be like an Ozu film. They have like... Uh, so, and then they realize that when you are imitating, the only person who can do a Scorsese film is Scorsese. The only person who do a Tarantino film is Tarantino. So they realize that the next stage they do is autobiography. So they look at the things that happened to them in their own life. This is my students and indeed I think many people learning. And they try to do things they have experienced. Films are stories that they have experienced. But I explain to them that most of you live very boring lives. These are my students. So the stories are not that interesting. Sometimes they are, of course. Sometimes they are absolutely fantastic, but mostly not. But still, you, 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 you do that, and uh, it's, you learn a lot from the first two, so that by the time you get to three, you're starting to be able to be your own filmmaker. Someone asked me at a, at a talk like this in China, said, Nick, how do, you, how do you decide to have a style? Like Scorsese has a style. Like, um, and uh, I said, well, you know, I know a lot of these filmmakers and uh, you, don't, you don't have a style. You don't impose a style on your filmmaking. Your style comes from you solving the challenges of the film you are making. And from the choices that you make, your style will grow upwards and out of that. You're, in the first one, you try to do it, I want my films to be like X. It doesn't, you learn it doesn't work. So that's kind of, you know, how if you're a genius, then I always say to them, you don't need to go to film school <laughs> if you're a genius. But, uh, but if you're a genius, you just skip the whole lot and you start making amazing films and we all hate you, but we love, our, love your films. And uh, 
So that's a little like thing. That's Steve Soderbergh, the American director, who who uh, gave me gave a talk at my school, and that that was his sort of analysis. This is like the seven stages of a student production. Actually, I would say it's the seven stages of a professional production. To be honest, you know, wild enthusiasm, total confusion, utter despair, search for the guilty, persecution of the innocents, promotion of the incompetents and distribution of t-shirts, and it is kind of like that. But out of that process comes some extraordinary work. My students say, often ask me, Nick, can you tell the other students what a producer does? And I say, you, would, that is, a producer would never want that. Why would you tell someone else how you do what you do because you are creating competition for yourself. I said, it's good that it's a mystery. It's really good. People don't know how or what we do. And it's really, uh, and you should, uh, and you will be appreciated not because people know what you do. You will be appreciated because of what you do. So if you are producing a production, you know, uh, the other people on the production and the, and the director, of course, they will appreciate you because of what you do. And they don't really need to know how you do it, or actually what it is. This was my favorite description of producers, which is, uh, you know, that they have to be craftspeople. People understand how to make, not themselves, but how to work with other people to make really good pictures, really good script, really good direction, and so on. Uh, psychiatrists, because we are always having to deal with people with problems, uh, we are bullies in that we force people to do things. And uh, I had a story about ladies in Lavender once where they said to me, we were just putting the money, having a big meeting of all the different people who are giving, <coughs> investing money in the movie. And at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the, one of the main financiers says, Nick, you have tricked us again. I said, trick you? No, don't be silly. I would never do something like that said, yeah, you have sent the British Oscar-winning actresses, uh, Judy Dench and Maggie Smith, down to start shooting, and we don't have a deal. And I said, we do have a deal. He said, we don't have a deal. I said, we do have a deal. He said, we don't have a deal. I said, uh, I said to him, uh, I said to this guy, I said, this is, the, we, this is the film business. You know, if you don't like the film business, get another job. And he went, Nick, you think I haven't thought of that? So, you know, we, I was bullying them. I had all started the movie, even though we hadn't finished the deal. Because I knew if I didn't start the movie, it would never start. So I have to kind of start in order to force their hand. Otherwise, they will talk forever. They will argue about contracts. They will make life difficult. You will lose your actors. So very often, you have to bully people. Uh, goalkeepers, we have to stop goals. Translators, we were forever trying to, you know, we are very often, uh, this, the, the director and the cinematographer are not communicating well. Or the cinematographer and, and uh, one of his crew. So we as producers are in always trying to make sure every, each person understands the other person to the extent they need to, to do like great work. Goalkeepers, friends. We pretend to be friends to people. Um, firemen, we put out fires when there are problems. Ditch diggers, just do manual work when it needs to be done. Mind readers, because we're always having to think, what does this person think, what does that person think, what are they going to think of this, what are they going to think of that, are they, how are they going to react or act. Uh, bomb throwers, so we make movies like the one I was talking about, where, which is very controversial and people are upset by it. And a spittoon, that's you know what you spit into. Uh, so those are, that's just some of, of, of the things that, uh, and uh, my final lesson, you know, is you need luck. This was a sign on, uh, on uh, execution chamber, you know, closed for safety reasons. That's kind of a joke. But, um, you know, you do need luck in life. I mean, people say you don't, but I think you do. And some people, they don't have the luck, and that's just the way it is. But uh, some people, of course, have the luck and they, they throw away the opportunity. 
But uh, most of the time you need luck, but you need to look for luck. You need to be, you have to always do the extra stuff. That means you're somewhere and someone else isn't and something happens when you're somewhere that uh, you know didn't happen. Like when I was invited to, to come here uh, to talk to, to Madame Tozo and uh, Professor Tozo and uh, uh, by Ken, you know, I asked if I could talk to the students here because you never know who you're going to meet, what's going to happen, and you can get a, a good flavor of, of what's happening. This is a guide to the Western film industry. I, don't, I think it probably applies to Japanese. I, I just, you can get it off the internet. It's kind of funny. My favorite one is, if you start at the top and go to this side, it says, do you appreciate money above everything else? No. Can you get excited about someone else's idea? Not really. Do you have exceptional literary talent? No. Are you bitter about it? Yes. Be a film critic. So that's uh, where I say producer here is, um, you know, do, uh, do you have wild imagination and no shame? Whoops, that's the wrong one. Where are we? Somewhere there. Yeah, are you skilled at uh, cleaning up other people's messes? Yes. Do you stress about it? Yes, producer. Uh, but it's kind of fun and it's worth looking at. You can find it on the net. So this is just a little bit about, uh, about our school. We are one of the youngest film schools in the world, founded in 1971. All the original film schools were founded by either fascists or communists. They were founded by Lenin uh, in the 1920s in Moscow, Hitler in Berlin, Mussolini in Italy. These were the first film schools because film at that time was like the internet now. It was the, it was the, the, the means of selling their new, uh, their new uh, political philosophies. And um, I'm going to cover the rest of the things, but just so you know, we are... We are not like a normal school that one third, of the, one third of the funding of the school comes from the government, one third comes from the industry, and one third comes from the students. So we, as the people running a school, we have to please all three of those. We have to please the industry by giving them students they, they want to use. We have to please, obviously, the government, and we have to make sure the students are getting what they need, uh, or we are... are um, Failing. When you come out, you come with a master's uh, from Royal College of Art, which is one of the big, most important art schools in the world. Um, and so uh, that's uh, a little bit. We're uh, they're two years long, and um, the deadlines for courses are uh, are in different months, depending which course you are sort of interested in. Uh, just to let you know, and it's cheaper now because the £10 note has just become the £9 note after Brexit. The economics people here will understand that. Uh, we do more courses for behind-the-camera crafts than any other film school in the world. This is just some of them, pretty much everything. We are also into games. We're into science and wildlife filmmaking, which could be interested for people who are doing that on the academic side here. Uh, you know, we are doing uh, marketing and distribution and sales and we're doing creative business and entrepreneur things. And uh, big people like Harvey Weinstein are, are backing those courses. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter, which is the, the big trade magazine for Hollywood, that named us the number one school in, uh, in the world. And also in the annual Global Film Student Film Awards, we have won those uh, four out of three out of the last four years, and we have won them two. We've won all three categories in one of those years, and two out of the three categories in every other year. So we're kind of proud of that. This is my favourite picture. This is at the Oscars. You'll have to take my word from that. What is brilliant is I think that the pro student producer here holds the record for getting the most number of tickets for students ever to go to the Oscars. She managed to get, normally just the director and producer go to, to the Oscars to receive the award and get their seats. We got 10 in. We got 
you know, we got the produ production designer, the composer, cinematographer, the editor, sound designer, production manager, and so on, all, all, all into the Oscars, which I thought was kind of cool. Then that was a uh, few, about four years, five years ago, and then about uh, two years later, uh, we got nominated again, and then uh, uh, last year we got nominated again. And these are student films in the big Oscars for the short films. This is the, all of the nominated people for last year that received nominations in the Oscars. Uh, this was teacher at the NFTS, he won Best Foreign Film uh, for I Ida, uh, Pavel Pavlikovsky. These are our two students, and there should be two more, but they were late, <laughs> which is difficult. And then we got nominated again in that year, 2015. And we had clearly quite artistic films. This is full-size animation, where we are doing the animation of full-size figures painted on a wall and then painted a movement, so it's quite... And of the number of film schools that have had Oscar nominations in the last six years, uh, there have been six and we have three of those. So we have 50% of the nominated nominations for Oscars for film schools. But on the more commercial big films, uh, you know, and obviously if you are in law, you can be doing entertainment law and you can be in this area. Uh, but this is our favorite, this is my favorite graduate of the NFTS. He's called Roger Deakins, he's cinematographer of the Cohen brothers, of James Bond, uh, he's an amazing, Thing. He holds the Oscar record in the whole history of the Oscars for having the most number of Oscar nominations but never having won it. I think he's got a 14th nomination and he still hasn't won it. And, uh, and Stuart is kind of similar but he does win it a lot. He does the sound on, on big Hollywood movies. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, Roger's latest shoot with the Coen brothers. And this was Skyfall, you see, which is packed with uh, NFTS graduates <coughs> in, involved in, in the film. Uh, and let's see, uh, BAFTAs are the British Oscars. So we have won both BAFTAs for short film for the last three years. No one else has got a look in, which we're very proud of. There they are, and last year, this year, it was all women winning the BAFTAs, which was the first time ever, which was great. But at the London Olympic Games, we had a, a lot of our graduates were working with Danny Boyle uh, on the opening and closing ceremonies. Uh, those we saw, okay, our school is really boring to look at. It's not like particularly thing, but uh, we've just invested another 20 million pounds uh, into, into the, the school. Um, so what are we, what's important to us as a school? Uh, we are different to many schools because the audience is important to us. We want to make films that will reach and communicate with an audience uh, that they're wanting to do. We're also about all screen sizes. For us, the story determines the medium, so we don't care if it's, uh, if it's uh, iPhone, whose sales have just dropped, or, you know, Galaxy, which they've withdrawn, but um, we don't care if it's small screen, medium, or the cinema. It's uh, because the story is the important thing and it should go to the media. Uh, that's important. Hard work, we don't have to tell. In England, I have to tell them that if they come to our school, they have to work hard. We don't have to tell people in Japan that, I don't think. Yeah, you all work hard. Yeah, do they all work hard? Asking a European. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is it? So it's a, um, and it's the pursuit of excellence. You know, that everything, is Steve Jobs, you know, some people are not used to the idea of being in an environment like this university, by all accounts, where excellence is expected. Not when you arrive, but when you leave, that you've got to that position where, where, where what you do is excellent. But we're also in the AFTS looking for individuality. You see, you laugh at me because I'm different, I laugh at you because you're all the same. And uh, we are looking for the, for the black sheeps of the world at the NFTS, for the people who are really individuals, are not necessarily thinking. I always say it's more important to march in the opposite direction to everybody else.
that's a thing. We are also, for us, storytelling is very important. We are not about non-narrative or experimental filmmaking. We, are, we want to tell stories. This is my favorite one. The, the, the writing class was asked if they could uh, write a short story that contained religion, sexuality, and mystery. You know, and this was the one that won it. Good God, I'm pregnant, and I wonder who did it. Uh, so, but we are at the heart of what we do, every course, is how sound, editing, direction, production, how that all supports the story we are trying to tell and realizes it. It's very confusing. You can see from the different position of the hands how they, <laughs> how they tell stories. I love that picture. <laughs> but, uh, but really, in our school, this is the two-year journey, you know, which is from idea, making the idea seductive, to the result, making the result seductive. And the result will be a game, a film, TV show, commercial, whatever it is. And you don't... Um, uh, so a lot of effort goes into making sure that ideas are seductive, are interesting, sexy, uh, I mean sexy not sexual, but kind of sexy, exciting. And then it's really hard to take something that's an exciting idea to the end where it's equally exciting or even more exciting. And you know, we are, we are about, uh, as I said earlier, about the audience. But it doesn't mean big audience. If you make something, a film for your grandmother, then the most important thing is your grandmother takes from the film what you want her to take or, or provoke the reaction. You want it to provoke a reaction. You may not know what reaction. And uh, like here, it's, it's quite tough. And the, the reality is not always easy. We, don't, we have very few dropouts at the NFTS. This is... Uh, you know, the glass is always full, technically, because it has water and air. Scientists here will understand that. Uh, but we have very few dropouts. Really, people only drop out because parents die or they have illness or, or something really major. Uh, because we are all working as teams, not as individuals. So we can't afford to have people leave the school. Uh, and, uh, yeah, things don't always go to plan. But one of the... One of my, this is one of my favorite things, <laughs> because when people come to my school, you know, they have normally been to university or been in the industry. This is, uh, uh, so a lot of them, they have, they don't have, they have a lot of knowledge, but they all have different knowledge to each other. So I always say, when you are in deep shit, show nothing and try to look like you know what you're doing. Very important for producers, for us producers. Uh, we talked about that, we talked about that. Let me just go through these, because I didn't know if the showreel was working. And um, I just want to get through this. Uh, and games, and brilliant film that. And then there's a kind of how we teach. And uh, these are, first of all, a lot of master classes. You know, we have had uh, here, uh, you know, we, we've had here David Yates, he's Harry Potter, Guy Ritchie, Sherlock Holmes, Snatch, uh, Sexual Drugs and uh, Rock and Roll, P.T. Anderson, Christopher Nolan last December, Sam Mendes, uh, you know, Ron Howard, the big American director, uh, Yorgos, one of the most interesting directors working today, uh, and the big writers like Aaron Sorkin, I uh, did the West Wing, Social Network. And just this, this in the last uh, three weeks, we've had Danny Boyle, um, multi-Oscar winning. We've had Steve McQueen, multi-Oscar winning. Uh, there's Danny. Uh, and we just had up on Monday the Korean director, Park Chan, you can say Chan Wook or Chan Wood. Uh, and, uh, the, um, and the Monday before, we had Werner Herzog, the iconic German director. So there's a lot. This is our philosophy. To study is not necessarily to learn. And this is very important to us because it's, uh, you know, we say to people, we are a learning institution more than we are a teaching institution. You learn through doing things, through making things. Uh, 
rather than through lectures and similar uh, things. But they, um, you know, we want teachers who don't cover the curriculum but uncover it. And uh, we're really looking for peer learning. 50% of what our students learn, they learn from each other because you have specialists. So if someone wants to know about sound, they go to sound department. Someone wants to know it's quicker than finding a tutor, and they probably will give a better answer. And I use it in negotiations with the teacher's salaries, because I say if the students are only learning 50% of what they learn here from you, we should only pay you 50% as much. But it doesn't work. Uh, and, um, but uh, a lot of peer learning, the, the, the learning from each other. And I think this is a nice sort of philosophy. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. That's why we are in the learning through making things, making films, making shows, always doing stuff. And also it's very important that people are able to make mistakes so they really properly learn. And uh, that's uh, not how school is spelt. And the other thing is that we here in this university, you are rightfully proud of being a, you know, a theoretical school of, of great intellect, great tradition, you know, uh, 500 plus years of, uh, of stuff, but we are kind of the opposite. You know, we are, you know, in theory there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And then we are, um, and so what do we look for? Some of them I've talked about, that's a typical NFTS student. This is what the, this was a little description of not for tomorrow's students, but uh, for today's students, <laughs> saying they watch Disney films, not the Disney Channel. They liked Nightmare Before Christmas, the Tim Burton film, they're the Harry Potter generation. They loved Interview with a Vampire Before Twilight, and they're the last people on Earth to have a one at the start of their birth date, as opposed to a two. Uh, and this was the Kipling thing that I was, um, you know, talking about uh, uh, earlier with you people. You know, the, the other big thing for our school is that the students need to be always asking questions, not just listening, you know, and they should be asking what and why and when and how and where and who. And that's the way they learn really quickly and more than others. And uh, the other thing uh, that is important for us is, um, you know, is engaging uh, with, um, with the world. We, we need our students need to engage with the story, the craft. They have to engage with each other, of course, uh, with themselves, but also the industry, the audience, and, and culture, and art, and all of the different uh, stuff. And passion, if you're a big football fan like me, we know what passion is, you know. 2-0 to Reading, that wasn't so hard for the Arsenal team. Um, but this is my son at the, at the pre in British Premiership. And, um, but passion is important, but it needs to be accompanied with skill, intelligence, application, and all those other qualities. And then finally, this is another Korean proverb, people who do not spit, people do not spit on a smiling face. And uh, this is a, you know, uh, you, it's good to have people who have sun, what we call a sunny disposition that are nice to be with. People like to gather around, not the spirit of the party, they don't have to be noisy, they don't have to be loud, but that people get naturally gather around and will diffuse situations of, of tension or, or problems. And finally, this is probably the biggest thing I, I learned from Richard Branson. You know, it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, it is because we do not dare that things are difficult. So we're looking for people who have guts, who are courageous, who will, uh, quite, are not bothered about whether everybody th else thinks they are wrong or thinks they are stupid or thinks they are badly dressed or thinks they are, you know, idiots because it doesn't matter what the rest of the world think, it matters what you are doing. And therefore you need people who have the courage and guts to, to do stuff. And then we want students who wanna like be at the top of the tree, who are gonna you know, climb and, uh, and really achieve. And as I said, we want people who are different. 
This is the typical career path of NFTS students, uh, graduates. So the blue one is the intended one, the red one is the actual one, and uh, the yellow is how much they drink. And uh, success. Because I say to our students that if you are not successful, I get fired. And they say, well, we don't care, Nick. This is the great Arsene Wenger. He is manager of the Arsenal football team. And this is very important in a master's course because sometimes people, you know, come, they think they know everything. And there doesn't seem much point coming. But the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. <laughs>